This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, once again, my guest is Eben Alexander. Eben, thank you so much for being here. Well, Heather, it's great to be with you again. Uh, I love our conversation. Oh, it's been so interesting, and I've got so many more questions. I also just wanted to mention quickly that I got this book probably 11 or 12 years ago, but I was rereading it again yesterday, and it really is so well written. So I just wanted to mention that to you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I just wanted to add there is now a 10th anniversary edition of Proof of Heaven. It has 36 additional pages in it uh, beyond the first uh, book. And uh, especially the new foreword, I think you'll find uh, very, very illuminating. Tells you a lot of what's happened in the scientific world over the last decade about understanding these kinds of experiences. Well, that's wonderful. And it does read like a novel. So I do recommend it. Now, initially, when you were beyond this earthworm view and heaven looked earth like to you but much clearer it was obviously prettier but you know you saw fields you saw trees you saw streams people even dogs but then you went to the core and i'd really like to know more about what you experienced in the core well the core is uh it's an infinite it's basically a dazzling darkness it's uh, the complete resolution of all paradoxes. I mean, if you can imagine uh, the scintillating, sparkling brilliance of, of darkness in its purest form, you're starting to get where this is all going. Uh, and, and do recall that my uh, journey to get there uh, involved this light portal coming from the Gateway Valley, where I saw all of the material world, four-dimensional space-time collapsing down, all of that spiritual realm and its different ordering of causality, deep time or meta time uh, collapsing down until what I had left was this, uh, what I called an oversphere. The oversphere was basically the universe throughout all of eternity. And it was there as just a minor teaching tool compared to everything else because uh, uh, there were, I mean, you cannot put into words so much of what happens in this kind of a journey, especially in that core realm. In many ways, people often talk about a border. Uh, you know, did you pass a border? Uh, and in general, the answer for most indie ears is I sensed a border and then I knew I either had to come back or go on forever. Now, for me, I think a crossing into that core realm was crossing that border in many ways. Uh, I know that uh, Susan Wrenches, who played an important role in my coming back to this world, she was a family friend for decades who happened to do channeling, uh, you know, and she had written a book called Third Eye Open. And my family asked her to intervene on nights four and five of my coma. So from 120 miles away, she channeled to me. But the reason I bring her up is she told me six months later when we reunited after all this, that mine was one of the scariest uh, encounters she'd ever had because she'd had many encounters with people in coma. And she kind of used the analogy, it was like going to an oasis in the desert. And she goes up and she starts pulling on a rope that's coming out of a well. And as she pulls, she feels more and more resistance as she can pull the person up, pull the soul back to this world. But she said, in my case, she got to the rope and pulled on it. And it's almost like I wasn't still on the other end. And so I was that far gone. And given that many of her patients had gone on to die, in spite of her intervention, she was very concerned about the depth of how far I was gone from this world. And that's kind of what I think is matched by that uh, the core part of the story was I, uh, that's where many of my lessons were taught. And yet it was far beyond uh, anything that is kind of the earthly realm or the, the gateway valley that is kind of a world of ideals that kind of feeds into what this world can be like. But the core is uh, where oneness with the divine was, was crystal clear. In fact, I came to see our very conscious awareness is ultimately uh, sourced in that God source. So we're never, ever distant from that at all. Now, you said, each time I reached the core, I went deeper than before and was taught more in the wordless, more than verbal way that all things are communicated in the world above this one. I imagine that some of the experiences were so beyond understanding. Are there things that you hold back about sharing about the core because people just wouldn't be able to grasp it? Not really, but it, it's just there's so much to it. I mean, if you would ask me when I first came back to this world and was waking up in that ICU bed, how long I was gone, 
you know, once I started figuring out a bit of what had happened, uh, because when I first woke up, I had no memory of my life before. So uh, it took days and, you know, a week or two to start filling in the gaps and blanks. But if you'd asked me then, I would have said I was gone for years, months or years. It seemed like a very extensive journey. And that's, you know, where so much has come out over the last 15 years of my sharing the story. Uh, because if you listen to my interviews, you'll find that I'm often on different kind of focus of, of in that particular talk or discussion. So there was a lot going on uh, uh, in that realm. And in fact, I would say a lot of it I just wasn't, did, wasn't even aware of in terms of having direct memory of it when I came back to this world. So it's taking meditation. I began about two years post coma of a form of using binaural beat brainwave entrainment, very powerful way of going deep into conscious awareness, which of course, uh, my partner, Karen Newell, the co-author of Living in a Mindful Universe, she's the co-founder of sacredacoustics.com. Uh, so she has tremendous wisdom on that. Well, I was zeroing in as a neuroscientist on a meditative technique two years post coma and realized that was a beautiful way to really, uh, expect a tool to give me tremendous uh, transcendental journeys because I knew that the sounds, the binaural beat sounds, interf influence the lower brainstem. So it's the fact that they're going for such a primitive target that really arose more than 300 million years ago in evolutionary neurobiology. That's where the power comes from. And so I was starting to meditate uh, daily uh, and have used that uh, in the 15 years or 13 years since I started that technique after my coma to help me come to a deeper understanding of much of my journey. So much of it that I've been able to put into words after these meditations, I didn't really have a clear view of, or at least enough to talk about earlier. So the meditation has contributed greatly to my kind of understanding and unpacking of the many different elements of my near-death experience. And we do have Karen coming up in an episode, so folks can listen to that. I wanna talk about a quote in your book, Proof of Heaven, about the core. And then I want to break it down and, and talk to you about four different things. So you, you refer to um, the core as Om, which is kind of like God. Would that be correct, first of all, before I... Well, Om was what I call that deity, that source okay. of pure, unconditional love. And, and the reason I did that was because that was basically the kind of sensation I had. I remembered this profoundly resonant alm sound deep in the core that uh, was part of that, uh, you know, the universe throughout all of eternity that I was seeing. So it was a very fundamental kind of part of the experience. And yet to me, uh, trying to call that God uh, was full of baggage. And I knew that wouldn't work. Uh, you know, God is such a loaded word for so many people. And also I realized, you know, this is not, not as we mentioned minutes ago, you know, trying to label it to fit some religion, because ultimately all the religions are based in the truth of these kind of journeys. The near-death experience community can point out very clearly what the essence of these journeys are, of, of the kindness, the love, the compassion, the mercy. Uh, every bit of that is writ large in these uh, journeys that indie ears bring back to this world. And to try and claim that only one religious system has it right is really missing the boat. I would say that to the extent that any uh, religious thought leader completely focuses on all inclusivity, you know, never excluding any being or anything from this process, and also focuses on kindness, love, compassion, mercy, acceptance, and forgiveness when necessary, and of course, never forget gratitude, um, then that religion is on target. But the instant a religion start to become exclusive, start to a foment battle and conflict with others, that religion has clearly lost its mind and is off the rails and needs to be discarded because the ultimate message here really is that golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated. And the more any religion comes truly close to that, then they're really approaching the, the uh, golden essence of near-death experiences over thousands of years. Okay, so here's the quote that I was referring to. Ohm told me that there is not one universe, but many. In fact, more than I could conceive, but that love lay at the center of them all. Evil was present in, in all of the universes as well, but only in the tiniest trace amounts. 
Evil was necessary because without it, free will was impossible. And without free will, there could be no growth, no forward movement, no chance of us becoming what God longed for us to be. Horrible and all-powerful as evil sometimes seemed to be in the world of ours, in the larger picture, love was overwhelmingly dominant and it would ultimately be triumphant. So that's the quote. And now um, I just want to break it down if that's okay. Sure. Um, the first part I just loved, um, just because you talk about love, you know, being at the center of them all. But um, the one thing that really caught my ear was evil was present in all the other universes as well, but only in the tiniest trace amounts. So does that mean we're living in the worst one? No, I wouldn't say the worst one. It just, we happen to live in the one that is necessary for us to have the right ingredients to grow. Uh, and so the, you know, the darkness and uh, challenges we find in this universe are there to help us grow into the souls we came here to be. Uh, and of course, in our current era, it looks like we might have more than our fair share of evil. But when you really look over human history, especially over the last few centuries, where you can, uh, you know, really get to some of the, the hard data about it all, what you do find is that things like violent crime and warfare are diminishing. Now, that might not seem like an accurate statement given the situation now in Ukraine and in the Middle East. And yet the reality is the 20th century uh, saw far, far worse conflict in terms of loss of human life and violence and hardship. I mean, the Second World War involved 53 million fatalities around the world. So uh, it, it may be hard for people to believe, but we're actually maturing and growing beyond all this. Now, it does come in fits and starts. So, for example, I thought our world was making great progress in terms of harmony, in terms of accepting each other uh, over the last few decades. And yet, in the, the especially the last uh, half decade or decade or so, we've really taken many steps backwards um, and, you know, towards what appears to be a darker, darker more egocentric and evil uh, focused world. And yet I would say this is just the natural order of things as we evolve. And again, not to forget that these hardships and challenges in many ways are what guide us towards that higher position uh, of love and compassion and kindness for our fellow beings. And I think that's what a lot of the hardship in the world today is doing, is actually going to end up pushing us back onto a far more favorable and harmonious track as we realize that these narcissistic, uh, egocentric, especially authoritarian uh, uh, people ruling the world and fomenting uh, warfare and violence uh, are the exception. And really, all of humanity can rise up against this kind of madness and realize that the common man is really the ally. Uh, and it's not that we're against other nations, but the leaders of various nations can fool people into believing that violence and warfare is the best way forward. But that's never the case. Uh, and we've learned that from history. And that's why I think a lot of the hardships and difficulties emerging now will ultimately nudge us back onto a proper pathway of acknowledging the peace and harmony that we share with each other and shared meaning and purpose that we have with the universe at large. Which brings me to this next line, because you said evil was necessary because without it, free will was impossible. And without free will, there could be no growth no forward movement, no chance for us to become what God longed for us to be. Right. Well, it, it, I mean, free will is a gift. Now, I'll remind people that the materialist science that I worshipped before my coma, you know, as that Harvard professor, associate professor of neurosurgery, that science would laugh at you if you claim to have free will. Uh, because in many ways, they, they say that uh, if the brain is creating consciousness, then consciousness is just an illusion of the chemical reactions and electron fluxes in the brain of material that's following all the laws of, of physics, chemistry, and biology. So where would you possibly inject free will into that at all? And that's where a discussion of quantum indeterminacy is so critical, because quantum indeterminacy is basically the catch-all uh, concept in science that tells us that from the viewpoint of quantum physics, the future is wide open. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility. It's not deterministic from the get-go. And uh, this is where I think a quantum informed science of consciousness is so important 
for helping us to come to this uh, kind of deep realization of the importance of our free will. And uh, that free will is something that becomes crystal clear in a life review of a near-death experience because you realize you had all these choices in life. And it's how you treated other people that really reflects how much your soul has been able to learn and teach and grow and transform through this process of existence. And the more we can come to realize that it's not about the little ego's progress and self-aggrandizement, but much more about the higher good and that our soul's contributing to the higher good, that's when all this starts to line up and make far more sense. And certainly in terms of finding guidance and making decisions and choices and how we live our life, how we treat ourselves and others, it's crucial to get this, uh, what I would say for me was a 180 degree flip away from uh, the mindless nonsense of materialist uh, thought, believing that the brain creates consciousness and you know, when brain and body die, it's uh, the end of conscious awareness to recognizing that uh, we're sharing one mind, uh, one, one heart consciousness, as Karen would put it. And this makes far more sense. So the brain is seen then as a filter, a reducing valve that allows a, a, a limited eddy current of that primordial mind to be our experience of existence. <clears throat> but ultimately, we are all sharing the mind of the universe uh, and that of uh, kind of self-awareness of existence is a property of the universe itself. And that's where uh, this kind of richer understanding of the one mind and of our shared consciousness is so important. And that completely uh, upshifts away from the bleak and paltry fiction of materialist science that tries to pretend that only the physical world exists and that when your brain and body die, that's the end of your conscious awareness. That's just flat out wrong. It doesn't fit the data. Well, and the good news about this quote too is that you know, you say, despite all the horrible things that are happening, love is overwhelmingly dominant, dominant, and it would ultimately be triumphant. So that's good news on that one. That That is the good news. And that's what brings tremendous optimism in my life. Uh, you know, in spite of all the hardships and the challenges and what pops up on the uh, headline feed on my iPhone every few minutes of uh, you know, that's that's not all of reality. There's a much grander reality of what's going on in this world. And also, it's kind of a general principle that when you have a major paradigm shift, that the fundamentalists that are so threatened by that shift in worldviews, uh, you know, rise up. They recoil in horror. Oh, no, uh, that's what materialist science does. Uh, you know, they feel that their worldview is so threatened. And that's why they try to suppress the evidence. They don't come up with counter arguments and rational uh, thinking and other evidence that supports their view. They simply deny the evidence that supports this uh, much grander view of the of oneness of mind and of our shared purpose. All right. We're going to change topics here because this was something else they write in your book that fascinated me. You said, I saw an abundance of life throughout the countless universes, plural, including some whose intelligence was beyond that of humanity. Now you haven't really discussed that a lot, but did you actually see other life forms? Well, what I saw were these uh, vast visions, and this was in, in the core realm of civilizations <clears throat> far more advanced than ours. <clears throat> the analogy I often use is they were as advanced beyond us as we are beyond earthworms, if that gives you kind of a general idea but an incredible kind of uh, wisdom. And I think this is part of soaking in that uh, kind of ocean of consciousness of the core realm was being able to witness all that. But there's a general principle of resonance so that the more kind of foreign and exotic some of these visions and uh, experiences are to us, the less likely we are to even witness them on these journeys. So, um, you know, I can hardly speak to what, you know, might have been there that I couldn't possibly even bring back to this world. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why I've continued to use meditation is because for me, meditation has been a way to revisit over and over again my NDE, not just to recover memories of the experience itself, but especially to develop and cultivate an ongoing uh, relationship and understanding and uh kind of ongoing experiencing with the qualities, with the entities, with the guides, everything that I encountered in that realm and initially in my NDE, um, you know, I've tried to return for more. 
And that includes unpacking those incredible visions of advanced civilizations. But uh, they really are so kind of exotic and uh, different from our normal vibration and knowing that it's very hard to bring that knowledge back into this world, into kind of a human expression. Uh, all I can tell you is, yes, there was a lot to it uh, that has awakened my interest in, uh, uh, you know, certainly in, in these uh, what are called the contact modalities by some people, you know, the UAP phenomena, other phenomena of civilizations that uh, may be playing a role in our evolution as a civilization. You also mentioned that there were countless higher dimensions. So do you think that's all around us and that there's actually life all around us? Well, I believe so. And in fact, you know, people often ask me, where is this realm you visited? Uh, and what I would point out is you really should be asking, where is this realm, you know, this material realm that we point to? Because one of the deepest lessons of quantum physics that's so shocking and the scientific community is still just beginning to unravel what it really means um, is this uh, uh, this <clears throat> notion that all of the out there out there is really just occurring in your mind. It's occurring in the realm of the mental. Uh, in fact, quantum physics is pretty clear on telling us there is not an objective physical world out there. That's what is so mysterious about the measurement paradox, about uh, uh, what is called contextuality, uh, which has to do with the mental process of the investigating scientist and what it uncovers in a, in a quantum experiment. Uh, it refers to, for example, John Wheeler's participatory anthropic principle, quantum physicists recognize that mind is fundamental in the universe. And it's taken us a long time to get to what that really means. But that's what we do in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, is we blend together neuroscience and the hard problem of consciousness. We blend in philosophy of mind and the binding problem, the apparent unity of consciousness in an individual. We put together with all that, uh, all the evidence for non-local consciousness, like telepathy, remote viewing, distance healing, out of the world of parapsychology, and of course, uh, quantum physics, right at the core of it all, uh, the main field of science that is demanding that, that consciousness be seen as fundamental in this universe and that the physical world only emerges from the realm of consciousness. So it's a tremendous paradigm shift that in many ways uh, up levels and up shifts uh, human thinking for 5,000 years or more. So it's really a tremendous kind of shift in our understanding that's, that uh, is upon us. And that's one of the reasons why I think people should get that this is a scientific investigation. This is not just all woo-woo nonsense and unprovable, but it turns out a lot of what we're trying to assess is stuff that cannot be measured, uh, you know, like love. Uh, how do you measure that? Well, but it turns out that... Uh, uh, I'll give you a very quick example. If you want to depend totally on neuroscience to get to answers on this kind of thing, you'll find a bunch of papers over the last 12 years looking at people under the influence of psilocybin, magic mushrooms, uh, a serotonin 2A psychedelic substance, plant medicine. Uh, and what they find is functional MRI and magnetoencephalography show you that the brain goes dark on those substances. No part of the brain increases in activity. And anyone who's ever taken psilocybin or LSD or DMT, other substances that have been studied by these same papers, uh, you might think your brain is lighting up like a Christmas tree. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, your brain is uh, actually going offline. So if you're hoping as a neuroscientist to better understand the phenomenology of those kind of experiences, you're completely out of luck. You won't get it by studying the brain because the brain is passing the buck to kind of the spiritual level and other uh, kind of uh, modes of understanding that go beyond the materialistic uh, view and the neuroscientific uh, tools that enable us to look at the brain, but not look directly at the phenomenal experience that we're trying to explore. You and other near-death experiencers talk about the oneness, that we're all connected. And many of you say that you believe in reincarnation, that you saw past lives. Sometimes, though, I wonder, are you seeing your own past life or is it just that we're all connected so you're seeing these lives? Well, the thing is, when you really study that literature on past life, and there's very strong scientific evidence for that, you can go to uvadops.org as starters, University of Virginia 
Division of Perceptual Studies. They've studied over six decades more than 2,700 cases of past life memories in children, of whom 1,700 cases are solved. That is, they actually found the person the child is describing. Now, of course, people who haven't read this literature will say, well, I don't remember past life, so it can't be true. Well, what Jim Tucker and Ian Stevenson, the uh, psychiatrists who've compiled all this data on all these patients will tell you, is you have to harvest those memories before age six or seven because they're natural processes that cover over those memories of past lives. So they're not so easy to get to. You can get to past life memories in hypnotic regression, in a near-death experience, uh, in meditation, things like that. But most of us, unless we're interested in this kind of thing, don't really explore consciousness and try and get to those past life memories. But plenty of children report past life memories. And this is so exciting because when scientists study them, you find you often prove the reality of reincarnation. In fact, that literature is some of the strongest material in this whole body of evidence supporting the reality of conscious awareness beyond permanent bodily death. Uh, and reincarnation is something I had never entertained before uh, my coma journey, but uh, after my NDE, it was crystal clear to me that reincarnation was part of the package, but I didn't know how to understand it. I also did not understand at that time how powerful the scientific evidence was supporting every bit of that reality. So anyone in the modern era discussing consciousness must be able to report how reincarnation works, how those memories are stored between lives. They're obviously not stored in the brain. Only one in five of those cases is in the same family. So you can't really argue for any kind of DNA and hereditary passage of information in the majority of these cases. Uh, and that's where we get into a much kind of larger frame of understanding what memory and experience is all about. Uh, but the important thing is in those children who have those memories, they recall it as a lived memory. So in other words, they don't just have an idle memory of events of somebody else's life. They have fears and phobias. In fact, one third of those children in Ian Stevenson's work had a birthmark that corresponded with the lethal wound of the prior lifetime. If that doesn't absolutely get your attention, I don't know what will. Uh, but in other words, there's a lot more about ourselves, our souls, our lifetimes, uh, and reincarnation. There's a whole lot more to explain than our current uh, scientific world can adequately explain. Thank you. You give us so much to think about. You've mentioned some websites throughout this episode, so I'll go ahead and put those links in the description. But once again, do you just want to quickly tell us about your books, your website, anything else that you want to share? Right. Well, there's that 10th anniversary edition of Proof of Heaven. So if you never bought it, you can go on and buy it now. You get 36 new pages that go a long way to telling you where all this is headed. Uh, then there's a map of heaven, but especially important, I think, is the book Living in Mindful Universe, co-written with Karen Newell, my partner. And from my point of view, the, my book Proof of Heaven is a big old question mark says, wow, these things happen, but how do we explain them? The book Living in a Mindful Universe actually goes a long way towards explaining how science and spirituality are coming together. We're coming to some ideas of how this can all work, uh, but we have to completely upshift our outmoded kind of materialist uh, way of, of thinking. Uh, so I think the books are important. You can find out a lot more about that at ebenalexander.com. Uh, that's E-B-E-N alexander.com. And especially, I would recommend there the FAQ page. It has a lot of information for commonly asked questions. Also, the, uh, the blog postings. Uh, in addition, there's a recommended reading list that has hot links to a lot of scientific papers. It's categorized. So that reading list uh, is, I think, a very important resource. And then, of course, the listings of interviews and uh, uh, podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. All that is there. Uh, and in addition, I certainly recommend innersanctumcenter.com, I-N-N-E-R sanctumcenter.com. Um, if you explore it, you'll find many different avenues of finding out more about all of this. That was uh, something that Karen and I set up during the pandemic, uh, and it has a whole host of interviews, two years worth of every two week interviews with other thought leaders around the world uh, on consciousness studies, other experiencers. Uh, and it also has a monthly uh uh, channel that we participate with our with our biggest fans on uh, all that at innersanctumcenter.com as well as a mental health practitioner course that we talk with taught with Dr. Anna Yusum uh, who wrote a beautiful uh, article on the 
utility of sacred acoustics in a peer-reviewed journal for alleviating uh, symptoms of anxiety in her busy Manhattan practice. She found a 26% reduction in symptoms. Anyway, that uh, course with Anna Usum is there. So those are all resources that I think people will find handy. And of course, sacredacoustics.com for those who want to lot, learn a lot more about binaural beat brainwave entrainment uh, and deep meditation. Eben, do you have any parting words before you go? I think uh, the best thing is to reassure people that there is plenty of reason for optimism and for hope in our future. Uh, as you realize that this revolution that we're talking about, about the primacy of consciousness, the importance of understanding the lesson of NDEs, the golden rule being written strongly across that whole literature, it's all good news for all of us because it can help us recover sanity beyond the kind of ego besotted world that we live in. It's time to move into a much healthier uh, and more harmonious relationship with each other and with the universe at large that honors the hopes and dreams that we came here to fulfill. And that's exactly what all of this discussion is uh, leading to. And we offer many practical tools to help individuals get on board with uh, this very optimistic view of where we're headed. Well, Eben, thank you so much. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation. It's been so informative, and I appreciate you taking time to talk to me. Well, my pleasure, Heather, and thanks so much for what you do and for getting this out there. You are so welcome. And for my audience, if you enjoyed this conversation, please give it a like. We also love to hear your comments. Share it with a friend if you like that, and please subscribe. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. Please add comments and questions you'd like future guests to answer. Also, if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. That'll help keep this podcast going. You can also go to Beyond with Heather Tesh to look for more episodes.